mean, you get a cutting board, too. You get a cutting board. I mean, you get 10 cutting boards. I get four cutting boards. That's the way my bonus means I get four cutting boards. That's it. There you go. There you go. Yeah. I'm dead. <laughs> I know. Okay. So, um, I was asked to talk about how these urns are, are built and assembled so that we get to the point that, that most of the members of this club can turn them and end up somewhere looking like this or like these, these two examples that Jan completed and handed it to me tonight. Um, and there's a fair amount of work goes into it before we before we get to the point where we can turn these. Um, first, we spend a lot of time trying to find places to buy lumber that is inexpensive but of good quality. We like to use cherry or mahogany um, or walnut we can get. Usually it's expensive, but um, sometimes we get phone calls like Don Boudreaux got today and somebody's father passed away that was a woodworker. He had a truckload of lumber in his garage and they asked us to come and take whatever we wanted. So we sorted through it and ended up with probably around 100 to 124 feet of cherry that will help us build about another 10 hours. And it didn't cost us a penny. So those kind of donations are, are really good and helpful to us. Otherwise, what we do is we take donated money and then we go shop around and buy it either at um, auctions or from the local suppliers. And when we tell them what it's for, they usually give it to us for a very good price, a very reasonable price. So once we acquire that lumber, um, we spend some time milling it um, to thick this so that all of the boards that we're going to make the staves out of are of uh, equal thickness, which is pretty important when we're gluing these up. And we like them to be um, greater than 13 sixteenths of an inch, all the way up to an inch. Works out really, really well. Um, and this is kind of my master for setting up the saw so that we can cut these. And what you end up with is you make 12, 12 of these, what we call staves, um, that go into making every one of these urns, along with one pop that gets glued on um, that we use to make that uh, this this dome shape up on the top. And if you're one of the lucky people that has volunteered to glue one of these up, this is what you get. You get a box with all of these bits and pieces in it. You should always check it and make sure there are 12 of them. And uh, 12, there's 12 here. Um, these staves are cut at 15 degrees, each of these um, sides. And they are seven inches long. And by the time it's all trimmed down, they end up being about six and three quarter inches. In when we're done cutting the tenon and whatnot in the bottom, okay? So what we do is you lay these out and you take a look at the grain patterns and you just arrange them so that it looks pleasing to the eye and you <coughs> check these and make sure that the grain's going in the same direction. Why that's important is when the light reflects off of these, if the grain is going in opposite directions, one piece will look very light and the other one will look very dark if there's a big steep angle in the grain pattern. If they're all going the same way, chances are it'll look much closer to the same color on each piece. So you go ahead and, and check all of these, get them all lined up. Once they're all checked that way, what you want to do is just line them up and make sure they're all the same length. Sometimes when we cut them, the stock gets some sawdust built up under it and you don't realize it right away. 
and you end up with stays that are all different lengths and make it very difficult to glue it together by the method that we use. So now that these are all lined up, what I like to do that helps us when we're assembling later is put two marks. Mark the bottom by running a line down here and then do a diagonal across so that you know what order they go in. That way when you stand them up and you're gluing together, you don't have to worry if you flip them around which end went where. You can just look at the mark and see that that, that line on the bottom means that has to go next to the table. Okay? Um, so what you do is you check all of these, make sure there's no burrs from the um, cutting operation. And if there is, you just take some sandpaper and you clean those up. Check them all. Um, takes a couple minutes. It's not a big job. don't do this, what can happen is you end up with an air gap and uh, where the glue and the wood don't come together. And that could be very dangerous for the person that's going to be turning it. That air gap can turn into an opening and it can fly apart when it's on the lathe turning at 500 RPM. So it's real important that if you're one of the folks gluing these up that you take time to do, to do this step carefully. There, so all done, and we're ready to stand them up and check to see how they fit. So you just start placing them in a circle. gets a lot of glue on it. So whatever you use to do this, uh, make sure you be willing to throw it away after a few uses. and make sure that everything fits, there's no, there's no gaps, that the guy who was pushing these through the saw was paying attention or the lady. Um, there, and so the fit looks pretty good for the most part. It's ready to be glued, so all you would do is take each one of these, Put a very, very generous amount of glue on there, buddy it up with the one next to it, and stick it in place, and do the next one, rub it up and down to spread the glue around, and work your way all the way around until you get to the last one. I thought you would have um, laid them out, put tape on the back, and then um, uh, flip it over, glue it, and put you, them together that you way. You could definitely do that. Um, I just found this was a, a lot faster and, and easier. Because really, once you get these these together, you want to make sure that they're clamped with a little bit of pressure. And what we what we found works fairly well is the people that do um, ceramics, I guess, pottery. They have these big rubber bands that you can buy, and um, you put them on here very carefully. 
what they do is they hold everything in place once you get the, get the glue on. And I'm not going to do the glue tonight because it, it gets pretty messy and I don't want you to have enough time. Mm -hmm. You can use a hose clamp, yeah. Use a couple of those. Um, I like these because in my shop I use them for a lot of other things as well. So I had them. And so you just fill up the side of this with the rubber bands and then you take the hammer, and I'm not going to hit this too hard, and you just tap all of these because it's going to help everything come together and the glue will start to squeeze out on the inside and the outside and you just want to let that stuff drip, it doesn't matter. The person on, that is going to be in here won't know that there's glue on the inside and the people on the outside are going to turn it off anyway so you can get to make a mess when you turn it off. It's, uh, it's great. <clears throat> Um, so once that's all together, um, you're going to take and make sure that this is flat, perfectly flat on this top surface because what you're going to do next while these are still wet is you're going to glue the top onto here. What you want to do before you even get into to gluing it is you probably want to make an X on here so it's there for reference when you glue this piece on. So you just get your square, mark the center. Show the corner tool that you're using. Yeah. It's a stare at centering ruler. Um, a, lot of, a lot of companies make them. Usually you see them with the right angle and the 45, but a lot of them come with this also, and that's what it's for. It's a centering one. Um, you end up with your X. That's going to be the center of rotation, and you're going to center this block on here when we get to the next step. So that's what that X is for. In the meantime, you're going to put a lot of glue on here and let it sit for a couple minutes. Set this on here enough to make a mark and put a bead of glue around here as well. Let it sit for two minutes. This is end grain. <clears throat> it's going to soak up a lot of that glue. You're going to start seeing bubbles. What you want to do is rub that in a bit and probably put another bead of glue around there. Put this on. Get it into position. Let it sit for another couple of minutes. The capillary action is going to draw that down on there fairly tight so that you can't move it. Then what you're going to do is take an F-style clamp. If you've got a big one, it's got a big opening like this, you can do it with one. Or if you've got C-clamps or whatever, you just do it at the corners and clamp on all four corners just to compress that on there and hold it in place. Okay. So that would go on, right on, on there. After that sits for under the clamp for, I would say, five to ten minutes, that glue will have set enough. You can take the clamp off and now you can get this block glued on top. And same thing, you're going to put a generous amount of glue on there. You want to use the Type 1 3 glue, the waterproof glue. It's the only one we, I would recommend. Um, it can handle a moisture or a moist climate. It won't give up over time. It being that these are going to be stored in a columbarium outdoors, the humidity is going to change. And uh, that's why we chose to use this. Anyway, we put generous amounts on here, rub it around so you can see it coming out on all sides. You line the four corners up with the X that you made that center and then you put your clamp back on and clamp that in place. <clears throat> Let it sit for at least 8 hours to 12 hours before you take the clamp and the rubber bands off. Once they're off, you'll end up with something that looks like this. You peel all these rubber bands off and then you go over to a band saw or whatever tool you have <coughs> and just lob off these corners so that you don't have these big wings on here. It makes it a lot easier 
for the person turning. Okay. Then what you're going to do is uh, hand that back to to me or whoever's collecting them, and then we're going to turn these over in this form to the wood turning club, which is you guys here. And out at Ron's, we meet every couple of weeks on a Saturday or a Friday. And um, anybody that wants to come and go <coughs> these urns, the shop's available to do that turning. Um, the next section is going to be on August 23rd. It's a Friday um, in about a week and a half, I guess. Yeah, actually, one week probably. You um, mean the, the tournament? No, turning session. We're going to make these. That's a Friday. Friday. Yeah, it's a Friday. 23rd. The 23rd of August. Anybody that wants to go show up at Ron's at probably 8, 30, 9 o'clock, and uh, we'll get you set up. Or they can take an iron home and do it too, right? If, if you're confident, yeah, by all means, take one of these glued up ones home and uh, or turn three. it. Or three. Or five. <laughs> How many can fit in your car? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. How, how many of you are there that are milling the wood and pulling it up? Like how many people are doing that? We mill the wood usually at, at my shop just because I have all the tools there. <clears throat> and um, guys from the South Florida Woodworking Guild come over and, and help me the days I do that. So one day we'll plane the lumber, and then the next day we'll cut it up into the staves and, the, and the, these tops, and then make then make the kits. <coughs> but to make 45 kits takes probably about half a day. Just out of curiosity, how does this become something that you were interested in? How did you get involved? So <coughs> there was a gentleman that was uh, the vice president of the South Florida Woodworking Guild who with a group of guys from that club were in a woodworking show in Tampa, right? Sonny, you were there? Yeah. And um, they saw urns that a gentleman was making for veterans in the local area. And um, they just, they weren't of the quality that you would want to be giving to a veteran who would but um, so much. Very simple. Yeah, it was. They were very simple and probably not not of best quality. So um, Brad and the guys came back and came up with a design that was uh, a square, a rectangular box, very beautiful looking. And um, we started making these with our with the South Florida Woodworking Guild. And after they made them for probably three or four permit ceremonies, um, Brad got sick and wasn't able to put as much time and effort into it. And the guys that had been the core group were kind of burned out from making these because the demand was pretty high. So some, some of us others got involved and one of the guys proposed this round design because we felt it was a lot easier to make. We could mill all the parts. They didn't have to be nearly as accurate as we did making a square one and we could get more people involved because we, we thought, being the deviants that we were, that we could get you guys to help us. <laughs> and it appears to be working so <laughs> um, So that's why the turn version, how it came about. And it's been pretty successful. Um, to date, we've built, um, as a combined clubs, 381 of these arms, either the rectangular ones or the round ones. Um, They've been, 240 of them have been provided to 11 internment ceremonies at the South Florida National Cemetery. And we, we provided to one internment that was at the Cape Canaveral uh, National Cemetery. <coughs> they had a lot of people to do, and they didn't have anybody to provide her, so they made us, we gave them the urns. Um, we've got about 50 in inventory right now that are complete and ready to go. Um, we have about 70 that are in process, somewhere between the box and the finished version. And um, we've provided 10 of these urns. Um, in fact, this is one of them 
um, to benefactors that have made pretty generous donations to the fund. And they just asked if they could have it because they like the, the style. And so there's one here that I made for a lady that made a donation. She wanted it made out of Purple Heart, so I accommodated her because I had some. And um, that, that's this one. And this is our original one, that's our demo. And this is a pretty good example of, the, um, of one that we turned, all ready to go. It needs a bottom, and it needs some finishing, finish put on it, but it's all sanded and pretty much ready to go. How long were the uh, ashes are put in there? How was the bottom? The bottom, we use a piece of quarter inch plywood, five millimeter plywood, and we just turn it to, to fit in the bottom and we attach it with three screws. And it screws into the this, this counterboard that's built into the bottom. What's the capacity? Um, approximately 232 inches. So it, we haven't had any complaints that it's not big enough. Um, the funeral homes like it because it's big enough they can make most everything. And the ashes are in a bag when they go in there, right? Yeah, they're in a, in a brick and they just Point of information: it takes one cubic inch a pound of person. Yeah. It takes anybody. Yep. That's one. So it'll be really heavy. <coughs> and the lady that asked me to make this for her, when I, she said, "How how much will that hold?" And I said, "230 pounds worth." She said, "Ah, you need to make mine bigger." <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I did a quick calculation, and I said, "Would this be big enough?" And she goes. Perfect, I'll go in and buy it. Yeah, so as far as the, the turning goes, um, come to Ron's on the 23rd, and we can go through that process. Um, it's pretty straightforward once, once you go through and understand the logic. Basically, what you've got to do <clears throat> is this square that you glued on the top, needs to become a tenon that will fit a chuck. And I had one here. So that you can put a put a chuck on the end like that. Okay? Um, and once that's done, this mounts on the lathe, chucks here, headstocks on this side, it's turning, and you can cut that counter bore in the bottom or rough it up. What you do to stabilize that is you bring up the tail stock and there's a we make a tool, what we call a jam chuck, that fits in here to stabilize it. And we rough out that counter bore. Then we remove the tail stock. We've got the chuck holding this. Very carefully, you take the tool and you clean that up, true up the sides, flat the bottom, and true up the whole bottom of this as well. And then you're ready to go. What we do then is take, we have a chuck or a face plate that fits in a chuck that we screw into the bottom of the, the urn. And then, again, put that on the, on the headstock side. It turns, and it allows you to turn that block off the top and complete your turning to get the, you know, the desired shape, which is right here. <clears throat> what we've been doing for finishing is uh, going through the grips, starting probably at 80 or 100, work your way through to 320, put on a coat of oil linseed oil, and then four coats of uh, shellac, uh, thinned with denatured alcohol, and then burnished with um, four aught steel wool. And that's really, that's the end of it. You end up with, uh, with an urn that looks pretty much like this. And then what we'll do when um, when it comes when the people from Missing in America let us know what branch of service the people going inside them are going to be, we drill a counterboard here and put an emblem on there for the branch of service they were in, and the nameplate goes on there. So we we dress them up like this, and that's what the finished product will look like for the service. Now, if it's for a spouse, there's no emblem. There's just a large, a much larger nameplate that's put on there, and um, that's all that's. Um, it's handled by one of the big national companies in the um, 
one of the one of the groups, I think it's the Veterans of Foreign Wars, I believe, or maybe the, the American Legion pays for those to be done. That's their contribution. Yeah, and it goes on the air. But they have to do it before they put it on the air. No, it's done on a brass plate, just like this one. It'll be engraved, and then we attach those. The guys from Missing in America, we get together one morning, and we'll put we'll put the, the emblems on, put the name plates on, and then they take them to the funeral home, and they fill them up and bring them to the ceremony, usually two weeks later. Hey, Stuart? Yeah. I was on that one. It was on the video that uh, mine. There's wood on the inside. Is that those, those blocks? Yeah, the blocks. Yeah. We used to use those to the, screw the into. Oh, okay. And um, because this wood is almost an inch thick, we don't really need them. So now that's he went to the counter boring and screwing it. Yeah. Okay. On the website, um, the South Florida Woodworking Guild website, is um, written instructions if you ever want to tackle this from the beginning through the turning and finishing, putting the emblem on yourself. Um, we documented the process, so that's there with pictures. You can take a copy of that. And there's also uh, a full-size drawing. This is just a, a short four times, but there's a big, a big drawing on there that you can download and have printed if you want. It's got all the dimensions on it um, for the terms and the two designs for the top. Is the instructions on the website updated for the new version? Yeah. Yep. Uh, which, which website is the information like? SFWG.org. South Florida Woodworking Guild. Dot org. Sure. Yes. Now, some of the people don't know that they can volunteer to participate in the internment. Yeah, so whenever we have internments, anybody that wants can volunteer to be a pallbearer or a flight bearer, and they're always looking for people when those ceremonies are happening. Up in Lake Worth. And it's in Lake Worth, right, at the National, South Florida National Cemetery. The ceremonies are really incredible. Yeah, they, they are. Yeah. Now, we just got word from Missing in America that we're no longer going to be able to have those ceremonies on the weekend because the federal government doesn't want to pay overtime to the employees of the National Cemetery. So we're going to have to do these during the week. So we're Missing in America project is working with um, the National Cemetery to figure out which, which days in each of the cemeteries are going to be available to us. And as soon as we know, we've got an internment coming up for, uh, for sure for 25 at the end of October. And there'll very likely be another one before Christmas as well for at least 25. And if, you're, if you really want to go to one before that, there'll be one September 23rd in Sarasota at the National Cemetery over there. When I get the information, I'll share it. Any questions? Yes? Sir, are the designs on the top, are they all being very consistent, or are there a little bit of fluctuation? No, there's a little bit of fluctuation depending on the person's flair and creativity. And um, this was the original design, and the intention was to use uh, influence from the Jefferson Memorial. We tried to maintain that, and we updated the design to this. And actually, I have to thank Gary Venema. He turned two urns, and they came back looking like this, and um, showed it to a bunch of people, and they liked it. So we, we opted to go with that design. It's a lot easier to turn than, than this one because there's less detail and it's a lot easier to finish. Are the new ones tall like that? No, this one I made large at, at the customer's request. Now normally, normally they're about this size. Yeah. It takes about eight hours to make one of these from start to finish. Um, consumes about three and a half, four feet of lumber. Um, and I, I kind of gauge everything by the amount of time and effort it takes to make 100 of these. So 350 to 370 board feet 
about a gallon of glue, two quarts of shellac, pint of oil and linseed oil, the service emblems, 400 screws to put the patch the bottoms, and about two sheets of quarter inch plywood to make to make these uh, these bottoms. Up. And then eight hours of labor per urn, or 800 hours for 100 of them. So it's a pretty big commitment by all the people that are involved, and that's you. Um, but I think it's a pretty worthy cause. That's why I'm involved. Friday, August 23rd, Bond's house. Be there if you want to be part. Screw the people that don't have big enough lane. Yeah. You can do glue ups. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you can do glue ups, or you can come to Ron's and we can get you into turning, or we can show you how to do finishing. Um, my wife doesn't turn, but um, she does like finishing. So she'll, these ones that Lee gave me, she'll finish these. And uh, she likes doing it. That's her contribution. Do you finish them on the lathe? Um, some people do. Um, I like to, just because it's fast. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I've got a lathe big enough, and I would like to make some of this. I can't make it to Ron's because work. Right. <laughs> uh, if the drawings for the, the, the new style is available, yep. I can go ahead and follow the drawings just make you a bunch, right? Yeah. Okay, how do I go what? Get the come and talk to me. Get okay. the get the instructions in the drawing. And um, but the drawing you have doesn't match what you make. It it will make um, then this this style right here. The drawing I saw makes the other. Um, it does both. It, it's good for both, both styles. Yeah, the bottoms are, are the same. Um, we, this was the original uh, shape, and we found it was it had too many curves in it to fit everything on. So we went to a little bit straighter side, and it made it easier. I have a repeater, so once I make a template, they all come out the same. Okay. So you okay. just tell me which one you want. It yeah. doesn't really matter to me. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Stuart, the drawings are on the home page of the Guild's website. Yes, yeah, sfwg.org on the home page. <coughs> the drawing and the instructions are there. And they're PDF, so you can download them. Okay. Bye, everybody. All right. No other questions? I'm done.